in writers have negotiated their role as public figures and used the mode of life writing in their of fiction through two case studies, um, Elena Ferrante's La Frantumania, which in English has been translated as Frantumania, A Writer's Journey, um, and Amelina Tom's Informed V, which has been translated as Life Form. Um, initially, these writers and texts may appear to have little in common. Um, Elena Ferrante is the pseudonym of an Italian author who's most famous for her quartet of Neapolitan novels. Although Ferrante tries to hide her true identity by not appearing in public, it would appear that she was recently unmasked by the investigative journalist Claudio Gatti as being the translator Anita Lyon. The case seems persuasive, although it's something confirmed by Ferrante or her publishers. Ferrante Malia was published in 2003, before her Neapolitan novels appeared, but after her first two novels had been published, um, Troubling Love um, and Days of Abandonment, which are these two. And uh, yeah, just thinking about the aesthetics of the photos in Auto Portrait on there, we've got a lot of room, people looking the other way, maybe an aesthetics of blurring as well, and headless women on her. <laughs> <laughs> um, Ferrante Mario is a collection of correspondence from Ferrante to various people over the years. Her publishers, journalists, the filmmaker who adapted Trump <coughs> into a film giving more details about her work, but also explaining more about why she's chosen to stay out of the public eye. As the contrasting front cover of Amelie Nottom's life form suggests, this Belgian novelist has taken a very different approach to the role of author. Um, she's a highly mediatized figure, um, whose image is often used in the paratextual <coughs> apparatus for the huge number of texts that she's published since her debut with Hygiene and the Assassin in 1992. <coughs> many of which contain autobiographical elements. Life Form was published in 2010, and like Phantomania, is an epistolary text. But in this, way, in this case, it is a two-way fictional correspondence between Nottom and one of her readers, Melvin Maple, who claims to be an American soldier in Iraq. Although this transpires to be a lie, Maple is in fact a web developer who is largely housebound in Baltimore due to his weight. Through Ferrandes and Tom's use of the epistolary form, combined with autofiction, we can see tropes traditionally associated with women's writing being re-employed and reimagined for the 21st century, when celebrity culture increasingly demands um, that writers share themselves with their readers through public appearances and social media. Autofiction appears as a way for women writers to play with the traditional expectation that their work will only be based on the personal rather than matters of public significance as well as allowing them to problematise celebrity culture by muddying the autobiographical waters to raise issues about female subjectivity and the role of the literary writer. Um, so I'm going to start by looking at Fernandez's text. Oops, we're not there yet. Um, uh, the letters in Fantomania often respond to questions about why the Italian writer has decided to use a pseudonym and refuse to appear in public. She discusses her rejection of the celebrity culture that demands that an author's work is associated with a face, which she points out comes more from the media than the public. Um, and she states, um, I have a well-founded fear that the media would be inclined um, carelessly to restore a private quality to an object that originated precisely to give a less circumscribed meaning to individual experience. Fernandez's use of a synonym taps into a long tradition of women writers who opted to keep their identity hidden as a form of protection or for greater freedom in their literary output. And it's interesting you mentioned Virginia Woolf, um, because I'm going to mention her as well. She reflected in a room of one's own on the women that chose to write under male pseudonyms, even as late as the 19th century, seeing it as part of a convention that <coughs> publicity in women is detestable, anonymity runs in their blood. The desire to be veiled still possesses them. They're not even now as concerned about the health of their fame as men are. Wolf is discussing women writers who chose male pseudonyms, whereas Ferrante identifies as female, as did Jane Austen, who published Sense and Sensibility under the name of signature by a lady. Ferrante has written about Austen's choice in an introduction to a recent edition of Sense and Sensibility, in which she stated of the English writer um, her stories are not reducible to her, rather they're written from within a tradition that encompasses her and at the same time allows her to express herself. 
In this sense, they're indeed written by a lady, the lady who does not fully coincide with everyday life, but peeks out during the often brief time when, in a common room, a space not hers, Austin can write without being disturbed. It is this desire to write without being disturbed and to resist her stories being reducible to her that Ferrante expresses for herself too in Ferrantumalia. Ferrante's letters draw attention to the way in which an author, as she puts it, is sold along with a book. Yet, despite wishing to hide her identity and to give a less circumscribed meaning to her texts, Ferrante's work has been read autobiographically and in search of the author. This has been motivated by the strong sense of realism that many readers have felt in her novels, which are written in the first person by women narrators, and in the case of the Neapolitan novels, from the point of view of a character called Eleanor. Um, long before Gatti's revelations, there were numerous projects and theories on the subject of who Eleanor Ferrante might be, um, including accusations that she was in fact a man or a group of male authors writing collaboratively. Rio uh, and Zatti in Naples, said to be the neighbourhood where Ferrante's Neapolitan quartet is set, has attracted tourists who can go on a guided tour of the various places that are allegedly referenced in the books, led by a tour company called Looking for Lila. Um, Lila is a name of Eleanor's friend who disappeared at the beginning of the novels. Um, Ferrante seems to have been unable to achieve the distance she claims to desire between her work and referentiality. Even without offering author photos or a media performance, she's been unable to combat the media's tendency to abolish the distance between author and book, between book and life. Yet there is some performance being offered by Ferrante, both in Ferrantumania and in the number of subsequent interviews she's given through written replies to journalists' questions which do offer up the author for analysis, reflecting on her writing process and on her use of biographical details. They can be seen as part of the promotion of her texts, even if she shied away from putting her face to them or from literary accolades. She might not appear in public, but she's present in public in written form. Moreover, she constantly moves between real-life details and fiction in Flantomania and in her work in ways that many readers have felt compelled to disentangle. She said that her inspiration for the friendship depicted in the Neapolitan Quartet came from a friend of hers that she cared for very much, although she also claims that her work aims to be purely fiction, stating in one letter of Fantomalia, um, what I write is full of references to situation and events that are real and verifiable, but reorganized and reinvented as they never happened. The further I am from my writing then, the more it becomes what it wants to be, a novelistic invention. Um, some of the letters in Flantomalia describe her memories of growing up in Naples, although the details she gives about this can be seen as autofiction, not only because Gatti's revelation suggests that some of them might not be true. If she is liar, her mother was not a Neapolitan seamstress, but a teacher, and her family only lived in Naples until Laia was three. But also because Ferrante herself cast doubts on her own account in her letters. Um, at one point she quotes Italo Calvino, um, who said, uh, I don't give biographical facts or I give false ones, or anyway, I always try to change them from one time to the next. Ask me what you want to know, but I won't tell you the truth of that, you can be sure. And she comments, I've always liked that passage, and I've made it at least partly mine. It was this approach that incensed Gatti and spurred on his expose of the author's true identity, as he argued that her open admission of not always telling the truth about who she was meant that she was relinquishing her right to privacy and throwing down the gauntlet for critics and journalists. Um, there are some, it, there's slight differences between the two translations there. But, um, however, this argument seems tenuous at best, and the competitive tone he uses to express himself in his article suggests a lack of respect for Ferrante and her stated wishes. Yet there is an enticing game going on in Ferrante's approach, which does not erase the author, but instead carefully controls what we know of her. She seems to hold out herself, her persona, whilst moving away from it at the same time, in a typical game of autofictional writers. Amelie Nottom's approach to the media's tendency to align the distance between author and work might be seen as contrasting to that of Ferrante, in the way that she's embraced promoting a public persona. However, I think here too there's a complex and sometimes paradoxical operation happening. Um, Mark Dealey has analysed the media's and the public's tendency to identify not on with her characters, whether she's writing autofiction or not. Some reviewers expressed doubts as to whether this 25-year-old woman could actually be the author of her first text, Hygiene and the Assassin, pushing not on to come forward into the public eye and prove her authorship through her persona. 
Since then, her images become well known and often pushed by her publishers in the paratext and publicity for her books. Moreover, she's often chose to write of her personal experiences, for example, of working in Japan in her 1999 text, Fear and Trembling, or of her upbringing and relationship with food in her 2004 text, Life of Hunger. Although she often includes a strong dose of exaggeration and humour in these portrayals as opposed to realism, as well as leaving clues about herself even in her works that are not clearly autobiographical. In an interview, uh, Natom has said that she reveals more of herself in her non-autobiographical novels than in her autobiographical novels, and states that she does not see the two categories as being particularly different, suggesting that perhaps she too is playing a game in her texts. Lifeform experiments with this tendency towards blurring the autobiographical and the fictional through its inventive correspondence. The text plays with the true detail that Natom's fans write her a huge number of letters that she responds to, Maple has decided to write to the author about his obesity as a result of his traumatic experiences in Iraq, partly because he was inspired by Natom's portrayal of her eating disorders in her work. And the Belgian writer's avatar in the text reflects that her correspondents often feel a sense of affinity with her. However, Lifeform's veracity is called into question from the first page, when Natom as narrator casts doubt on the authenticity of Maple's first letter to her, immediately casting doubt on her own text. This doubt later shows itself to be justified. It transpires that Maple is not a soldier and is actually writing to Natom from Baltimore in America, not from Baghdad in Iraq. Whilst Ferrante's letters in Frantumalia are real letters sent to real people, in almost all cases without their replies included, Natom writes imagined letters to and from an imagined reader, who has himself been engaging in fiction too, as it gradually begins to emerge. And she also includes sections in which she provides commentary on the letters that she's received from Maple, guiding our reading of them, as can be seen too in her imagined role of translator of the text from English into French. Ferrante and Otom are the authors of these epistolary texts, which both complicate their truth claims. In Natom's case, um, this strain from refer referentiality is shown by its subtitle of a uh, novel. You can't really see it that well there. Um, then by the inclusion of fictionalising on both the parts of Notom and Maple. Um, Frédéric Chevillot argues uh, that we can see Notom in the figure of life form who shares a nom nominal identity with the author, but also in Maple as seen in their first names, as well as in the fact that we eventually discover that it is Maple who gives the text its title of life form, as it's the title he gives to the folder of their letters that he's compiled. As with Ferrante, the author seems to come in and out of sight for the reader, even if Ferrante seems to be trying to hide, whilst Natom seems to be playing at being found. The epistolary form is very much suited to this game of hide and seek, and to exploring issues related to authorship and subjectivity, particularly to female authorship and subjectivity. Whilst it has a long history, the epistolary form has traditionally been associated with the female voice and, like women's writing more broadly, has historically been read or misread as being exclusively concerned with the personal and private. It has also been underestimated as a transparent expression of the private self in a way that is not dissimilar to how autobiographical writing has traditionally been seen, and Ferrante and Tom seem to be tapping into and problematizing this through their letters. Um, Goldsmith points out that published epistolary writing by women was traditionally rarely signed and was often in fact produced by male writers imitating the way women wrote. <laughs> Ferrante maintains this tradition of pseudonymity amid claims that she is in fact a male writer or writers, while the Tom's fabrication of her imagined male correspondent in life form subverts the traditional gender roles described by Goldsmith. The choice of the epistolary form Today appears old fashioned in a world of instant electronic communication through blogs, vlogs, emails, instant mes messaging, and social media. And it's striking that both Ferrante and Notom have eschewed these more modern forms of communication in their work. Neither have a presence on social media, in contrast to many writers today. Of course, for Ferrante, letter writing is a way of communicating whilst also keeping her identity hidden. And after her identity was supposedly unmasked by Gatti, a Twitter account briefly appeared claiming to be Anita Raya, admitting to being Ferrante and reiterating her desire to be left alone in a tone that convincingly mimicked that of Ferrante's correspondence. But the account was later closed and her publisher said it was a fake. I think I've got 
a bit uh, there a bit with uh, really terrible English translations of it, but it gives an idea of what happened. And this is the only traces you can find in the Tom on Twitter. It's that this one's a spoof account. Uh, yeah, it's quite funny. Um, but there are other ones that just sort of offer quotes from her work and things like that. But she hasn't got one herself. Um, Nothomb, in life form, particularly draws attention to her lack of technological know-how. At one point, she comments that the internet is unknown territory to her, and she emphasizes the slowness and materiality of epistolary communication, as seen in her trip away from Paris uh, when she doesn't receive any letters, leaving a hiatus in the narrative, or when she comments on rushing to catch the last post on a Saturday lunchtime. Both Ferrante and Nathan make a deliberate choice to avoid online communication in favour of re-employing the epistolary form in the 21st century. Yet, as with digital content, the boundaries between reality and fiction are still blurred in their letters. In life form, it's the physical trace of the handwriting in Apple's letters that eventually provides a clue as to the truth about their authorship as they transpired to be emails Maple had sent his brother Howard, who is actually a soldier in Iraq, to copy out and send to Nathan. Yet there's a clearly a paradox in this, as we know that none of these letters ever really existed, except in the form of this novel. Indeed, although Maple tells Nathan that he's lost touch with reality through his attachment to the computer screen, Nathan explains that it was letter writing that led her to become a literary writer. Um, Maple points out um, that his oh, my place, desire for some of the reality of Nathan's letter writing to her fans paradoxically led him to fabricate details about his own reality, suggesting that lying is a way towards the real, recalling Nathan's comments about her non-autobiographical novels being more revealing about herself than her autobiographical works. Nathan's rejection of the internet and of social media may seem paradoxical too, given her taste for sharing private information about herself through her work. Yet I would argue that autofiction, rather than being part of the current climate of writers as celebrities who share themselves in the media and online, often works against or problematizes celebrity culture, as the epistolary form chosen by these writers suggests. The letters, like or as autofiction, are constructed and mediated in a slower and more painstaking process, creating a sharp distinction between this type of writing and the instantaneous sharing or oversharing of personal details through social media platforms. Um, in Maggie Nelson's 2015 autobiographical work, The Argonauts, a description of her aversion to social media is revealing in this regard. Lately, I felt myself awash in a fresh irony. After a lifetime of experimenting with the personal made public, each day that passes, I watch myself grow more alienated from social media, the most rampant arena for such activity. Instantaneous, non-calibrated digital self-revelation is one of my greatest nightmares. <laughs> Wouldn't be a mummy vlogger. <laughs> Although the book is about motherhood. It's interesting. It's very good. Um, Autofiction, like letter writing, takes time. It's carefully calibrated and, and created using the tools of fiction. Although some of the content on social media is also carefully constructed and mediated, and many authors' Facebook or Twitter accounts are managed by publicists rather than the authors themselves, I would argue that autofiction has been seen by some writers as a way of counteracting the dominant form of communication of our time. Whilst there's a strong dose of autofiction in some online content, Literary autofiction has also been used by writers to empower them to maintain some control over their identity. And perhaps maybe you have another example of that. Um, overall, we've seen that autofiction through the epistolary form chosen by Ferrante and Nathan brings both women and writers <coughs> in and out of view in ways that they carefully and artfully control. Their letter writing and writing more broadly contain unclear configurations of truth and fiction that have allowed these women writers to play with their public and private selves in a world that tries to demand that they surrender themselves to celebrity culture and to direct and instant communication with the reading public.